Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on lymphoma from the 2023 American Society of Hematology annual meeting. I'm Hope Avalon, and I'm the Senior Program Manager of Patient Education here at LRF. During today's webinar, you'll hear from three expert speakers, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. You can ask them at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll aim to address them after the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can before the conclusion of the program. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, you'll be prompted to complete a program evaluation. And we do ask that you complete this evaluation because we incorporate your feedback into future programming and we'd love to hear from you. But for now, let's get started. Thank you again to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Kate and Lily, um, for, for sponsoring this webinar. Before we begin with the program, I'd like to share some information about the Lymphoma Research Foundation. First, we're the nation's largest nonprofit organization that focuses specifically on lymphoma. And our mission is to eradicate lymphoma and to serve those touched by the disease. All of our work is led by our scientific advisory board, which is a group of 45 leading lymphoma experts from around the country. And in addition to today's program, we have a variety of other programs and services available for you. One example is our LRF helpline, which serves to complement our patient education programs like this one. The helpline has master's level trained staff who provide individualized information on all types of lymphomas, as well as information on treatment options, clinical trial navigation, and connections to resources such as financial assistance. We also offer a peer support program called the Lymphoma Support Network. Through the Lymphoma Support Network, we can connect patients and caregivers with others who have been through similar experiences for emotional support. And in addition, LRF has free comprehensive disease guides and fact sheets, which can be either ordered or downloaded on our website at lymphoma.org. We also offer a variety of other in-person and virtual educational programming so that you can continue learning about the latest updates throughout the year. And finally, we have an award-winning mobile app called Focus on Lymphoma. And the app provides helpful disease content as well as unique tools to help you better manage your lymphoma. The app is free of charge in the Apple App Store and in Google Play. I also wanted to briefly mention two of our upcoming educational programs for patients and caregivers. This year, Rare Disease Day is on February 29th. And in honor of that, LRF is hosting an Ask the Doctor program focused on ultra rare lymphomas. So please join us if you're interested in learning more about navigating rare a rare diagnosis and the resources that are available for you. Also on February 22nd, LRF is hosting an Ask the Doctor program in Spanish with Dr. Enrique Diaz and UT Health San Antonio. If you're interested in joining or know someone who might benefit, you can find more information at lymphoma.org slash programs. But first, we have a wonderful program planned for you today, and we have three expert speakers, Dr. John Leonard, Dr. Jamie Ferlaghi, and Dr. Neha Mehta Shah. For now, I'm honored to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. John Leonard. Dr. Leonard is an attending physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital. He's also the Richard T. Silver Distinguished Professor of Hematology and Medical Oncology and Senior Associate Dean for Innovation and Initiatives at Weill Cornell Medicine. And finally, Dr. Leonard is a member of LRF's prestigious scientific advisory board. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard, for speaking on our program today. And without further ado, I will now turn the talk over to you. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I wanna to thank LRF, which is a wonderful organization for all it does for patients and research and the field. So thank you for uh, supporting LRF and I encourage the audience to uh, I'm sorry, thank you, LRF, for supporting the program, but I encourage the audience to learn more about LRF and how to get involved in the support, uh, its many activities. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, this will work. Great. Uh, and I'm going to assume that that's uh, working okay. 
Looks good. Uh, so I am uh, going to give a little bit of an overview of lymphoma and some updates from the American Society of Hematology on B-cell lymphomas. And just to orient the uh, audience who may not know, the American Society of Hematology is one of several major professional organizations for those working in blood disorders and blood cancers. And there's an annual meeting every year. This year it happened to be held in San Diego and over 30,000 people from across the world attend the meeting. And a highlight is uh, really presentation. There are educational sessions. There are uh, a number of different networking opportunities. People get together to work on projects and various investigator groups who are doing different studies in the field uh, submit what are called abstracts or brief summaries of their work and they are selected to either be published or presented in a poster format where people can walk around and ask questions or in various forms of oral presentations. And so this is really one of the major meetings annually throughout the world where uh, new advances in blood disorders are presented and is really, I would say, one of the major, if not the major meeting where new advances in lymphoma are presented. So it's great to be here and give you some background on this. So I'm going to talk about several types of lymphoma, and I'll hit some high points of what was presented at ASH uh, as I go through the different uh, areas. Uh, and some of these themes are kind of cross-cutting, some of which also go back to what you'll hear from our other speakers in a bit later. So my first um, real task is to give some overview, a bit of background on lymphoma. And this, in this very teeny tiny font, which you can't read almost by design, is just a highlight that there are over a hundred different types of lymphoma. And many of you know that this is, makes it very complicated to deal with if you're a patient or a family member or a caregiver, uh, or frankly, a physician treating patients, because we have to kind of figure out what type of lymphoma a patient has, and then really tailor the individual treatment and expectations to the specific type of lymphoma. And because there are so many, this is really, you might hear the term precision medicine. If you go back several decades, there were only a couple types of lymphoma. And now we have hundreds of types all with their, uh, in many cases, individual prognosis and treatment. So it makes it very complicated and essential that you know what type you're dealing with uh, as an individual. When we think about lymphomas, we take those hundreds of types and kind of lump them together often in practice. And this slide is a pie chart of the non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Dr. Florlagi is going to speak to you about Hodgkin lymphomas, which is about 10% of lymphomas. But we tend to think of indolent lymphomas, aggressive lymphomas, mantle cell lymphomas. You see some of the names here, and I have the bigger pieces of the pie. You'll hear uh, about the T-cell lymphomas from Dr. Mehta Shah a little bit uh, later as well. But really, uh, I'm going to focus on the indolent group, the uh, aggressive group, and the mantle cell group uh, as in the major B-cell lymphoma categories as far as my, my topic. And so we put these together into the major types of lymphoma. You're, you'll hear from Dr. Florlagi about Hodgkin lymphoma. You'll hear from Dr. Mehta Shah about T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And then I'm going to focus on the, the, the larger group, which is the B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas, which accounts for, again, about 80 to 90 percent uh, of lymphomas overall. And so I think it's really important as we think about any treatment for a patient at any given time, and whether you're newly diagnosed or whether you have relapsed lymphoma, we're, we're much of what we're going to talk about today is focused on treatments and new treatments, but it's really important that you think about what the goal or the reason of therapy is. In some cases, we're expecting and hoping to get rid of the lymphoma, to cure the lymphoma, and obviously we want to give the patient the best chance of making that happen if that's something that is realistic. In other cases, we may have a more chronic lymphoma that we're hoping to manage over a period of time. We may not get rid of it, but we want to extend the person's life, help them to live a normal lifespan with what I would call a hitchhiker kind of lymphoma along for the ride, keeping the hitchhiker in the trunk of the car as best we can. And then in other scenarios, the main goal is to feel better. It's not necessarily, unfortunately, to get rid of the lymphoma or to even live longer. But in some cases, it's just to, to feel better. And so 
when we think about therapies, we really have to think about, again, the best chance of cure when that's possible, extending life when that is possible, and feeling better when that is the prime issue that someone is dealing with. But it's important to keep in mind as we think about their therapies, the extent of the disease, how big the lymph nodes are, how much the lymphoma is bothering the person, other medical conditions, perhaps age or other medical uh, uh, issues such as uh, heart disease or lung disease or other things that impact the overall situation. In many cases, we have different options and the side effect profile is an important consideration. Side effects are always important, but sometimes they're the driving thing for a patient because you may have two treatments that work sim similarly as far as efficacy, but you might pick one over the other based on the side effects. And then clinical trials is also very important. Everything we're going to talk to you about today and pretty much anything your doctor ever tells you about lymphoma is based on clinical trials. And so we all prioritize clinical trials and clinical studies as part of lymphoma care as uh, a very important feature because that's how we learn more information and that often provides, they often provide the best uh, opportunities for new therapies, particularly if the options that one has for standard therapies are uh, limited or suboptimal in that particular situation. And then sometimes lymphomas can change, particularly if you have an indolent lymphoma, these can change to aggressive lymphomas. And so we're often thinking about that at the time of relapse and that may influence our thinking as well. So I'm now going to walk through some of the types of lymphoma and highlight we woven through this, um, and I'm going to focus on the B-cell lymphomas, but woven through this, I will highlight some of the new uh, areas and issues that have come out of the ASH meeting. So if you have an indolent or a follicular lymphoma, there are also marginal zone lymphomas fit into this group. Often these are patients where we watch and wait. Sometimes we use radiation if it's localized. Often we use rituximab or versions of rituximab that are antibodies, immune therapies that go against CD20, a target on B cells. Often we use different chemotherapies, a drug called bendamustine or a combination called CHOP in combination with rituximab. Sometimes we use a regimen called a drug called lenalidomide or revlimid, which is sometimes used instead of chemotherapy. We sometimes use a newer version of rituximab called obinutuzumab. And then sometimes we use maintenance therapies in the course of treatment of indolent lymphomas. And all of these have pros and cons, but are options for different patients at different points in time, depending on their individual situation. There are a number of new approaches, particularly in the relapse setting for patients with indolent lymphoma, newer versions of rituximab or anti-CD20. Sometimes we use radioimmunotherapy, radioactive antibodies not used that much anymore. I mentioned lenalidomide. There are drugs that hit different targets, one called PI3 kinase, a switch on lymphoma cells, another called EZH2, which uh, flicks switches and, and changes the profile of lymphoma cells in, in certain ways that help them die off in certain cases. We have, and I'm going to talk about in more detail, the bispecific antibodies, and then we have stem cell transplant and CAR T cell therapy, which come into play for certain patients. And I'll talk about newer data with those in just a minute. Now, if you're a patient with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL, that's also related to small lymphocytic lymphoma. That is uh, another form of indolent lymphoma. When it's called CLL, it often involves the blood. These are patients that we often observe or watch and wait in their therapy. One of the standard therapies is a regimen, an antibody treatment with, again, an antibody against CD20, a target on these cells called obinutuzumab. This is often given in, com in combination with a pill called venetoclax that interferes with a protein called BCL2 that helps keep the cells alive. So many patients receive obinutuzumab and venetoclax as initial treatment for uh, uh, CLL. Others may receive a drugs that fall under the category of Bruton's tyrosine kinase or BTK inhibitors. That's a BTK as a switch on lymphoma cells that helps keep the cells alive. And there are a number of drugs that have been around for a while, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, and a newer one called pirtabrutinib that uh, is used more after now, um, used after the other drugs. You see that the brutinib is the common 
uh, theme and the names of these drugs. So these are pills that, that flick switches on the lymphoma cells and help the cells to die off. And then there are lots of studies and, and new approaches with combinations of these agents that are coming into play as well. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about new data at ASH in reference to the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And you see across the top, there are categories of these drugs. So if you think of these as the, 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 the B cells, the bad guys in lymphoma have the light switch left on. If you think of a Brutinib, or I'm sorry, if you think of Brutin's tyrosine kinase or BTK as a light switch that's keeping the, the grow light uh, kept on, these are all drugs that flick the switch back to the off position, the BTK switch. And ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib are all pills that affect in different ways this, this um, light switch. Now, what you see across the top here is that certain of these pills are more or less selective for the light switch that we're talking about, and certain of them uh, affect or hold the light switch in the position we want it to be in for a, more, a longer or shorter period of time. This term irreversible, meaning a longer period of time, or reversible, meaning a shorter period of time. And so ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib are BTK inhibitors that are used primarily in CLL and in mantle cell lymphoma, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And as you go from left to right across the top panel, the, you get a little bit less in the way of side effects. One would say, certainly, if you compare a brutinib to a calibrutinib and xanabrutinib, and that's because they are more selective. They, the orange circles reflect the selectivity, and so smaller circles, more selectivity means that they go after the right switch and less after the other switches in the body, and that improves, in some ways, the side effect profile. On the, on the bottom part, you see nemtabrutinib, which is an investigational, not approved BTK inhibitor, and pirtabrutinib, which is uh, approved or used typically after the other BTK inhibitors, again, in CLL and in mantle cell lymphoma. And these are reversible. And there are certain features of this that suggest that they work after the other BTK inhibitors don't work. And so much of the new data at ASH was around pirtabrutinib as well as some of the other strategies to go after this BTK target. And pirtabrutinib is now approved, and we've seen more and more data to suggest that it can be useful in CLL and in mantle cell lymphoma in particular after the other BTK inhibitors um, don't, don't work anymore. And that's in part, or if the side effect profile uh, is an issue for the patient. And so these are, um, the, there was a number, there were a number of new studies at ASH suggesting that newer approaches to going after this BTK switch can be useful, even if the first generation or the first category of drugs don't work anymore, these newer drugs seem to work uh, in some, for some people. And so this is a very important moving target in particular for patients with CLL and for mantle cell. And there were more and more data at ASH around these drugs. So if you're a CLL patient, some of the questions that were being studied at ASH and we're seeing more and more data, I think the data are not definitive here, but they are centered around, can you stop treatment with a BTK inhibitor? If you're a CLL patient, most people getting the venetoclax obinutuzumab combination get it for about a year and then stop, but BTK inhibitors have been used kind of indefinitely, where you take them ongoing basis until you have either side effects or until they stop working. And so there are now very sophisticated tests called minimal residual disease tests that we're trying to learn about whether or not if you fall into one category, maybe you get the disease down to a low level, can you stop? the treatment altogether, which would be obviously nice to not be on treatment if you don't have to. And so I don't think we have definitive answers, but we're getting more and more studies around those questions. Another relates to the pirtabrutinib drug that I just referred to, the non-covalent or reversible BTK inhibitors. And these are, again, useful after the other BTK inhibitors stop working. And then there are more and more data saying, well, if we have these different approaches, can we combine a BTK inhibitor with another drug like venetoclax, that inhibitor of BCL2 that I mentioned earlier? And the idea being there, 
can we get rid of, uh, can we use it for a shorter period of time if we use two drugs at once? And again, lots of studies looking at that. We don't have definitive data, I would say, at this point in time, but that's something that, that we keep uh, working on because that's an important, when you combine two drugs, you have more side effects naturally, but maybe you can use them for a shorter period of time and be able to stop the treatment. And so those are, there are a number of studies looking at those issues. Now I'm gonna to move to mantle cell lymphoma. Some of you may be dealing with mantle cell lymphoma, which tends to occur in older patients, more commonly in men. And these have, mantle cell lymphoma has been treated in a number of different ways. It accounts for between five and 10% of patients with lymphoma. And there have been a variety of more and less intensive treatments that have been used for patients with mantle cell, mostly chemotherapy-based, sometimes stem cell transplant-based, even more intensive chemotherapy-based. So there's a lot of work going on uh, around uh, these approaches and whether or not a more intensive approach is, has value compared to a less intensive approach. Certainly more intensive approaches have more side effects, but maybe they could have more value. And the general thinking has been that more intensive approaches keep people in remission longer, but they don't necessarily make people live longer. And so you're balancing out the trade-offs of more intensive chemotherapy versus a longer remission. And so there are a number of initial treatments for mantle cell. There are a number of relapse treatments for patients for, uh, with relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. These include uh, lenalidomide or Revlimid, a drug called bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor. We can use different chemotherapy approaches. We can use combination approaches. I just referred to the BTK inhibitors. These have been uh, used and approved in mantle cell lymphoma. We have CAR T cells, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more uh, in a few more minutes uh, that are approved in relapsed mantle cell. And then we have stem cell transplant and other more intensive approaches that have historically been commonly used. And so the issues that have been looked at at ASH uh, include the role of BTK inhibitors as part of initial therapy. Can you use them alone? Do you use them in combination? There are certain patients, particularly those about 10% of patients with mantle cell lymphoma have a mutation in something called P53. If you have that in mantle cell, that tends to suggest that chemotherapy doesn't work quite as well. And so those are patients where we might be more apt to use a BTK inhibitor or other non-chemotherapy approaches a little bit sooner because we know that chemotherapy is not likely to work as well. And so there are more and more data about using BTK inhibitors as initial treatment, particularly in those with, uh, with P53 mutations or in combination with chemotherapy. And I think that the, the takeaway data are that if you add BTK inhibitors in early, in certain situations, you may get longer remissions you may have some additional side effects, and you don't necessarily live longer. So again, this common discussion of trade-offs uh, in patients with mantle cell lymphoma when we're talking about earlier use of BTK inhibitors. I referred to the use of pirtabrutinib. Again, this newer generation of BTK inhibitors after other BTK inhibitors, and again, more data there. And then one of the important studies presented at ASH uh, was a study called the Sympatico study that showed that, and my slide is incorrect here, the ibrutinib venetoclax combination seemed to be better than ibrutinib alone, not venetoclax alone. That's my typo. Ibrutinib venetoclax in patients with relapsed mantle cell lymphoma seemed to be more effective than ibrutinib alone. And so that was a study showing a potential benefit of a combination of a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor, over ibrutinib alone. Now, the, the caveat to this study is we don't use as much ibrutinib in mantle cell lymphoma anymore because some of the newer agents seem to have a better side effect profile. So more and more data coming along suggesting that combinations might have some value or at least some trade-offs. Now I wanna move to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This is the most common type of lymphoma it's the most common of the curable lymphomas, and so we focus on curing patients. We've got a number of different prognostic tools 
that we use in, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Most patients have been treated for many years with a combination of rituximab, the anti-CD20 antibody, with CHOP chemotherapy. And so we've had a lot of different studies over the years, and these continue. Can we cure more patients? We want to cure everybody. Can we reduce the toxicity? Can we identify subgroups of patients that can benefit from one approach versus another approach in a more precision way rather than treating everybody the same way? And so more recently in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, we have swapped in for the O drug called uh, Oncovin or Vincristine into the CHOP regimen, a drug called Polituzumab. And the idea here is that this is what we call an antibody drug conjugate. This drug basically binds to the, the surface of the tumor cell, gets internalized into the tumor cell, as you see on the, on the green, and then it releases a chemotherapy drug or, or a type of chemotherapy or toxin that basically interferes with the growth of the cell. So it's kind of a targeted way of delivering chemotherapy. And what we have seen in a study called the Polaric study, this was presented at the New England, in the New England Journal uh, about two years ago, that when you swap in polituzumab in a subset of higher risk patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, that you can improve outcomes, that more people go into remission and stay in remission longer, and you have fewer relapses. And so we have been using polituzumab for some patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And there were some data presented at ASH suggesting that this approach may be of particular use and particular benefit for patients with a subset of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma called the non-germinal center or activated B-cell subtype of lymphoma. And so we're learning more and more about maybe we should treat subsets of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in a little bit different way. Now, I want to just highlight in a big nutshell the whole field of CAR T-cell therapy, which is something that I'm sure many of you are interested in, have heard about. This has been a very important new area for particularly diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but other types of lymphoma like mantle cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. And CAR T-cell therapy is a scenario where you basically give a fancy blood donation the white blood cells are removed and isolated, particularly a subset of white blood cells called T cells that are immune cells that can be re-engineered. That's kind of the bottom left corner of this slide as you go around the reverse clock face here. These cells are then trained and engineered to, to essentially be souped up to go after lymphoma cells, to go after a target on lymphoma cells called CD19. And then they can give an be given back to the patient after some light chemotherapy. And basically then they set up shop and go after the tumor cells. This can be an effective way of killing lymphoma cells. It can work where other treatments like chemotherapy doesn't, don't work. And we'll talk about this in a second. And it's becoming more and more used in particular in patients with recurrent or relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This can be done where intensive chemotherapy cannot be done, meaning older and frailer patients can receive this therapy, but it's not without side effects. It can be associated with something, an immune reaction that we call cytokine release syndrome that can cause a temporary fever, chill, shakes, a reaction, and can also in some people have temporary, most commonly, neurologic side effects because this immune reaction revs up the immune system that as a byproduct, it can, can cause some side effects that can be serious and life-threatening. Now, these have been studied and now approved for several years now. We have good regimens to treat, to, to manage and predict and treat these and prevent these side effects, but they're still uh, also not zero. And again, the other major side effect of CAR T-cell therapy is that it can cause immunosuppression and some other risks over a period of time. This has even come into the news recently because very, very rarely patients can get other cancers. But again, this is a very, very rare complication of CAR T-cells, but something that we need to continue to study. For most patients receiving CAR T-cells, the, this is the best option. And this is something that uh, they need because the other treatments aren't working. And so there are more and more data that were presented 
at ASH around CAR T cell therapy, there are scores of new CAR T cells being studied, new versions of CAR T cells. And so many, many studies at ASH being presented on newer CAR T cells and newer ways to go after lymphomas in different subsets of lymphoma. And uh, so this was a huge theme and I don't have time to go into these details. Maybe we'll talk more about it, but trying to figure out who do they work in? How can we make them better? What can we combine with CAR T cells? Where do we not use them? Where do we use them earlier? And again, newer versions of CAR T cells that might be helpful. So a lot of work going on at ASH in this area. And this slide just summarizes, again, a number of the different approved CAR T cells. You see they have complicated names across the top. I haven't listed the, the trade names, but you see across the bottom that these can be useful in patients with particularly recurrent diffuse large B cell lymphoma, where they can give long remissions about a third of the time, which can be very meaningful for people if other options aren't working at all. They're now used as second line treatment for some patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and they're now used and available for some patients with mantle cell lymphoma, with B-cell ALL or acute lymphocytic leukemia, and in some patients with follicular lymphoma. So a very important area of research. And so there are lots and lots of studies. Most of the studies are, are single arm studies. There are some differences between the, the different agents. They work about two thirds of the time, depending on the setting, can be more than that. They tend to have long remissions about one third of the time, depending on the settings can be different than that. They do have some side effects, but again, approved for a number of different patients with relapsed B cell lymphomas. The, the other area that is therapeutically becoming very, very important is the concept of bispecific antibodies. Now, what is a bispecific antibody? Well, many of you are familiar with rituximab, the anti-CD20 antibody, and the idea is that antibodies have this Y shape to them, as you can see in the pictures in the middle column of the slide, where the antibodies typically bind to a target, the middle of the Y, and then the base of the Y, the gray part in uh, some of these, uh, is where it binds to the immune system. Well, a bispecific antibody has two targets to it, uh, hence the bi that where one target or one target of the antibody is the, the tumor cell, in this case, CD20 on B cells, and the other arm binds to immune cells, in this case, CD3, which binds to T cells. And so the idea here is that this bispecific antibody links the tumor cell to the immune cell, the T cells, and brings them together so that the T cell goes after the tumor cell in a more direct fashion. And so this is an in vivo or in the person version of the CAR T cells, where essentially what we're doing is taking the patient's own T cell that are circulating in the patient, bringing it together to the tumor cell to try to bring, to engage them to kill the tumor cell. And so the fact is that these are off the shelf. You don't need to give a fancy blood donation. They have some of the same immune related toxicities that I referred to but they can work almost as well. Some might say equally well, but I would say almost as well. And how close is close enough is in the eye of the beholder as the CAR T cells work. But they do uh, have the ability to get a good response in many patients where the standard therapies aren't working. And so there are several of these in clinical trials, several of these that are approved, in follicular lymphoma, you see bolded here mosinituzumab, which shrinks the disease about 80% of the time and gets a complete response in the majority of patients. And this can last uh, 18 months, 24 months or longer in some patients. And again, these are given over, uh, uh, rather than one time, they are given on a periodic basis. The schedule varies and they're given over months. And so these are a longer term treatment than the CAR T cells, but they're easier in that they're largely outpatient treatments. CAR T cells sometimes, but usually not, can be given as outpatients, but these drugs are primarily given as outpatient. And in fact, 
uh, they can they can have a lower lesser side effect profile and in some ways are a little more convenient because the logistics uh, don't require this fancy blood donation. They can essentially be infused out of a bottle like other medicines are given. And in recurrent diffuse large B cell lymphoma, again, these drugs work a little bit less well, but we have several, a couple of them that are approved, glofitimab and epcarinimab, the top and bottom here where they work in the majority of patients and can have meaningful re uh, remissions and complete remissions in over 40, in 30 to 40% of patients. And so again, these are newer options. They're kind of a CAR T cell light that work a bit less well, but I have less toxicity than CAR T cells. And some might argue are logistically easier. And so there were a number of different studies presented at ASH around these drugs, both alone and in combination with other treatments, as well as longer term follow ups from the many studies that were have been done over the years with these agents. And these are important new treatments for people, particularly with recurrent follicular lymphoma and recurrent diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And then finally, I'm just going to take two minutes to give you a very hot area that is not, I would say, ready for prime time, but a very interesting area that got a lot of attention at ASH. And this is around the concept of what's called circulating tumor DNA. So the idea is that if this is a tumor in blue and you have tumor cells, tumor cells are, are uh, in the absence of treatment, continually growing and continually dying. And you see in the upper left uh, part of this, a tumor cell, just uh, as part of the process of tumors growing, certain cells die off. And in part of all of this, the blood supply to the tumor, the arteries and veins are connected to the tumor. As tumor cells die off or as they grow, some of this tumor cells DNA get released into the bloodstream, just like in our bodies, if you look at our bloodstream, if you don't have lymphoma, you will see what's called cell-free DNA, part of the normal turnover of cells and growth of cells. Some of the, the DNA of, to, of cells leaks into the veins, and you can detect it in the blood. And so the idea is that patients with lymphoma have what's called ctDNA or circulating tumor DNA. And this is not infectious in any way or anything like that but it is a marker in the venous blood uh, going around that it, it's kind of like shed into the circulation is kind of garbage left over from the, the cells uh, in, in the form of little tiny fragments of DNA originating from the tumor. So why is this of any interest? Well, it turns out that if you do, do special blood tests, if you draw blood and analyze the blood for the ctDNA, you can analyze through very sophisticated tests, mutations in the DNA, uh, chromosomal rearrangements, patterns called methylation patterns, and other sequences of the DNA that are specific to the tumor. So you can essentially detect tumors in the blood or evidence of the tumors or evidence of the quality, meaning the nature of the tumor, meaning that if you see if a tumors have certain mutations, you can sometimes detect those mutations, not by needing to do a biopsy, but by analyzing the mutations of that circulating tumor DNA. So it's kind of like a liquid biopsy of the tumor where you can see remnants or shed material from the tumor and do some of the same analyses just from the blood. So how can this be useful? Well, it could be useful and is being studied in the early detection of cancer. Could you screen patients without a history of cancer to see do they have tumor-related DNA in their blood? You can analyze this circulating tumor DNA in a patient with known cancer or known lymphoma to say what mutations does the blood show, reflecting mutations in the DNA, which reflect what's going on in the tumor. And can you see this material disappear? So that could this be a marker of effective treatment? Meaning if the treatment works, all the tumor cells go away, all the tumor DNA goes away in the blood, that could be a marker that the tumor worked, uh, the treatment worked very well. And conversely, could this be a marker of relapse? If someone's in remission, if you suddenly saw by analyzing the blood that there was evidence that the, the CT DNA was 
now show tumor DNA in the blood, this could mean uh, be a sign that the disease is relapsing and therefore a time to early to have an early intervention to improve things. And so there were a number of studies, I'm not going to go through them, but these are just four of them listed where researchers are looking at this to try to predict is treatment working early by the disappearance of circulating tumor DNA? Could this be a marker of who's going to do better and who's going to do worse? Could this be a marker of relapse? Or could this be a marker that could save you a biopsy or give you more information than having to do a biopsy because you can sample remnants of the tumor DNA from the blood rather than having the biopsy to do so? So this is not ready for prime time. Don't go to your doctor tomorrow and say, I want a CT DNA analysis. It's all a research tool right now. But there are lots of ways where you can imagine in the future this could be useful and lots of studies ongoing right now to see where this would go. And I think this was a huge theme at ASH about things moving forward. And so to my last slide here, I just wanna highlight some general thoughts that accurate diagnosis is key. Um, outcomes for patients with lymphoma are improving. We have lots of new drugs, lots of new tools. And again, I just remind everybody that clinical trials are the key to, pro to progress in this area. So I'll stop and uh, turn it back over to Hope, and I look forward to more discussion, both from our other speakers and during the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard. Um, as a reminder to the audience, please be sure to direct your questions to the Q&A box so that we can get to as many as possible before the end of the program. Um, I'm now honored to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jamie Florlaghi. Um, Dr. Fleur Laghi is a hematologist and oncologist at the University of Rochester. She's the division chief and academic director of the Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at Golisano's Children's Hospital. Dr. Fleur Laghi is also the director of clinical research at Wilmot Cancer Institute. She's also a former LRF scholar, current grantee, and member of the Foundation's Adolescent and Young Adult Lymphoma Consortium Executive Committee. Thank you so much, Dr. Fulagi, for speaking on our program today, and I will now turn the talk over to you. Thank you, and I'm excited to be here today. Thank you to all who are logging on, and thank you to LRF for giving us a platform to share updates in a really meaningful way. Dr. Leonard set the stage really well for a few topics I'm going to touch on today, and in general, the ASH meeting was really exciting for Hodgkin. So a few pieces of that specifically. When we think about ASH, I was trying to highlight what is new this year. And so LRF gives a lot of updates, but there was the most anticipated clinical trial data for advanced stage patients with Hodgkin lymphoma at ASH this year. We are all anxiously awaiting the presentations and I'm excited to get to be the person to So to back all the way up so I can set the stage for the data we saw. So what we've seen in Hodgkin lymphoma and many on this call have probably benefited from, or certainly I hope so, is the success of adding novel agents to the standard of care. So going back, starting in about 2018, brentuximab vedotin, or an anti-CD30 antibody drug conjugate that essentially takes vincristine or vimplastine, a microtubulin inhibitor, and targets it to the CD30 expressed on Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. This drug, was trialed in combination with standard therapy and randomized to exactly the standard therapy alone to see how much better is the targeted brentuximab compared to the regular drug we had been using. This happened both for adult patients at the same time as pediatric patients. And in 2022, the incorporation of brentuximab vedotin to the standard of care happened. This data was originally presented this past year by Dr. Alex Herrera at ASCO. It was really exciting news to show what we did next. Okay, so to clarify, Dr. Leonard said this a couple times, clinical trials improve the future. Thank you to every patient who's participated on them. And if you didn't decide to go on a trial, those were for very good reasons. But what a trial allows us to do is ask meaningful questions to treat patients of tomorrow better than we can today. Specifically, from a pediatric standpoint, 
It also allows us access to drugs that are often not approved in pediatric patients. Okay, so what was the standard of care that we built on for this exciting data? So on the left, I mentioned BVAVD, or a drug combination, taking the standard of care, ABVD, dropping the bleomycin, adding in brentuximab, in the Echelon 1 trial showed us that the six-year progression-free survival with BVAVD here compared to ABVD was better, 82.3% versus 74.5%. I put an arrow because I want to come back to the six years. This is a six-year progression-free survival. This data was carried out for a long time. On the right, at the same time in pediatrics, we established a different standard of care. The backbone that was prior standard was ABVEPC, a bit of a different combination. And when bleomycin was dropped, rentuximab was added. You can't give the two together because of pulmonary toxicity, so you have to drop the bleomycin. And some of the doses of a microtubulin inhibitor were substituted out for rentuximab. We saw the same thing. The three-year event-free survival for rentuximab vedotin was 92.1% over the standard of care, 82.5%. So 2022 was a big year in New England Journal for both adults and pediatrics. We had frontline data that showed rentuximab added to standard of care, improved event-free survival and became a new standard. So what's come since? Well, the next step, and this is what we are all anxiously awaiting, rentuximab vedotin was then shown as something we should be incorporating frontline for patients, pediatric and adult. Nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and other checkpoint inhibitors, and I'll come back to what they are, had hit the stage. So when looking at this, this trial is so big for so many reasons. So if you haven't heard S1826, I'm excited to share it with you now. SWOG, an adult consortium, together with Children's Oncology Group for Pediatrics, for the first time came together to treat patients on the same trial. This was for advanced stage patients, age 12 and older. Significant credit needs to be given to Drs. Kelly and Castellino from Children's Oncology Group, as well as to Dr. Herrera and Dr. Friedberg from SWOG and many others who have championed this. In the field, adolescent and young adult treatment has hit the main stage for really good reasons. It's important. Being an adolescent and a young adult is a really delicate time in people's lives. It's hard to make big decisions. For most of them, it's hard to know what to wear to school that day, let alone being able to decide what treatment you're going to receive for this cancer diagnosis you now have. But very importantly for Hodgkin lymphoma, we must focus on AYA patients because it is who has the disease. Hodgkin lymphoma is a disease of adolescents and young adults, technically 0.15 to 39. So what this trial did for the first time is allow us to put patients of all those ages on the same trial and see how patients age, different factors, play into their outcomes and study them as a whole. So this trial took the old standard just shown from Echelon 1, BV, AVD for six cycles for advanced stage patients and said, is nivolumab, one of these checkpoint inhibitors, better? So let's run them side by side. BV, AVD for six cycles, or nivolumab, AVD for six cycles. If you haven't heard how a PD-1 inhibitor works, we talked about brentuximab already, the targeted vincristine, vimblastine microtubulin inhibitor to the Reed-Sternberg cells. The PD-1 inhibitor works completely different. So this nutshell cartoon, if you have not seen this, is a T cell or one of the cells that's supposed to recognize cancer in our body and kill it interacting with a cancer cell. So sure, T cells see a cancer cell. The cell surface of each type of cell interacts in many different ways, not just one. And one of the interactions is between a PD-1 on a T cell and a PD-1 L1 on a cancer cell. So sure, the T cell sees a cancer cell, it interacts, but when the PD-1 binds to PD L1, it turns the T cell off. And it's one, away, one of the main ways that a cancer cell can escape the immune system. So what a PD-1 inhibitor is trying to do is on the right, this is Opdivo or nivolumab. It is blocking this receptor. So the T cell sees the cancer cell, 
it recognizes it at its, it as cancer, and the PD-1 inhibitor blocks the binding of PD-1 and PDL1, and therefore the cell cannot be turned off. The T cell sees the cancer, and the T cell can attack the cancer, so it blocks the stop signal. The cancer cell can no longer evade the immune system. So this is how PD-1 inhibitors are working. They're helping T cells see the cancer and not be turned off by this interaction between PD-1 and PDL1. So this data was groundbreaking, fabulous, and really interesting for a couple ways. I mentioned because it treated both pediatric patients and adults. But this past year at ASCO, Dr. Herrera showed us early data, a one year early, a one year progression free survival. What we saw is a top line 94% event free survival. That's fabulous for the Nevo ABD arm, over 86% on the bottom for Brentuximab ABD, or what was the standard of care. Importantly, in this backbone, there's almost no radiation therapy. Several pediatric patients receive radiation, but adults did not and dexrosoxane was permitted, and I'll come back to that later. So we all saw this data. We knew it was awesome. This was all patients that went in the trial, but specifically for pediatric patients who went in and older adults, we needed to know how did the different groups do, and that data is what came to us at ASH. So first, the pediatric patients. We were able to see the progression-free survival and toxicity, the pediatric subcohort of this trial. At ASH. What we saw, so for patients who were calling pediatric age 12 to 17, similar curves emerged. 94% event-free survival at the one-year mark for patients treated with Nevo AVD versus 88% with Brentuximab AVD. These are young patients. Out of almost 1,000 patients who enrolled in the trial, about 200 of them were pediatric age about equal amounts received both arms, so it wasn't because there was more patients in one versus another. And patients who received six cycles of doxorubicin or the anthracycline component that can create heart effects over time received 300 milligrams per meter squared. That is more than a pediatric threshold, which we are trying to keep below 250 milligrams per meter squared. Lower than that dose correlates with decreased late effects, decreased cardiotoxicity later in life that we are attributing specifically to this drug. Dexrazoxane can be given 30 minutes before doxorubicin to help try to prevent the cardiac toxicity of doxorubicin itself. In this trial, very importantly, almost 80% of patients received dexrazoxane. So we will be able to see how that cardioprotectant worked in these patients who are very young when we look at how they do later in life. Okay, so how did the older adults do? This was equally as exciting to see for a very important cohort. So the subset analysis for patients greater than 60 years old came out. So what did we see? Patients over the age of 60 often struggle to achieve a cure because the therapy itself is hard to tolerate. Here we see the curves show a dramatic difference. 93% event-free survival at one year for the Nevo AVD arm, over 65% for BV AVD. A couple caveats. This is only 97 patients, so acknowledging small numbers. I say that because from a statistical perspective, when the numbers get small, just a few more events start to really shift the curve. So if a few more people end up having a relapse in one arm, the curves will very quickly come together. So acknowledging it's early, this is really fabulous data. About 39 of the 97 patients had made it to the one-year bar. And so we'll see what happens as this data matures. But for a patient population where we need new therapies that have less toxicity that patients can tolerate and cure them, this is looking really good and really promising. So this was very exciting data to show. It's important to think, was Nevo AVD better? Yes, but also was it tolerated? And I mentioned this sort of tolerability. So in the patients older than 60, who often can't tolerate therapy as well, 
What you can see here is the nivolumab AVD versus BV AVD. There were less grade three toxicities overall for the big ones that we look at, including febrile neutropenia and sepsis or overwhelming infection. The one thing to note is that there was more hypothyroidism and rash seen in the Nevo AVD arm because that is from the drug. So that is to be expected because it's one of the side effects. So conclusions, this was big this year. Nevo AVD versus BV AVD. You know, my pause is it's early. If there are patients who are out there, some people are starting to give this therapy now given the data we have. And some feel like it's too soon. And both of those approaches are very appropriate. It is early. This readout was at one year. And the reason we got to see the early look is that when you're on a clinical trial, they're monitored constantly for safety and efficacy. It's been a long time since one of our trials was closed because one arm was early to show it was better. And that happened. So this trial was closed early and we got to see what the data looked like because the nivolumab AVD arm was winning by so much. Surely the Nevo AVD shows improved progression-free survival and was better tolerated. And certainly for older adults, Nevo AVD is poised to become the standard of care for patients that can receive an anthracycline-based regimen. And despite the success, the work is not over. New agents require us to monitor these short and long-term toxicities. I mentioned it was a home run that this is pediatrics and adults together, but we have to be mindful that the late effects are much more significant the younger you are. In our young patients who are age 12, these immune modulation late effects are what we just have yet to see. We don't know what that will look like. Maybe, and our hope is, they'll be just fine. But we need to know that we are not swapping out known side effects for ones that we don't know and creating bigger problems later in life. What is that unlocking of that PD-1 system doing to their immune system? So more work is to be done, but these were very exciting results that we got to see at ASH this year, and I'm happy to be able to share with you all. So next, that was advanced stage patients, but what are we doing for other groups of patients? What about early stage patients? And I wanted to show this because this was also exciting and promising. So as I move into this to pause, there is an ASH education program that came out. It is free for everybody. You can look at it online. I know a lot of people who join these calls really want to be able to read more. The ASH education program that comes out is a nice summary of a lot of pieces. Considerations for treatment of early stage is one of the ASH education pieces if you want to read it. And what I liked is them really pausing to recognize we need to balance efficacy and late effects. You can cure patients with early stage lymphoma without fancy targeted agents. Or we can use them, but are we adding toxicity? What is that profile looking like? So just being mindful, especially for early stage. Yes, we can cure these patients. But how are we curing them now? And what effect will it have on them? What will the cost of that cure be for the survivor? So great thing to go back to and read. So as we look at this, you know, bleomycin affects lungs. We know that. We've known that for a long time. But one thing that came out was true data about bleomycin and lung function for at least five years after the treatment of Hodgkin from a large trial called the RAFL trial. And what they showed is essentially bleomycin diffusion capacity of lungs over five years show that if you had ABVD versus AVD. So the whole point is the only thing different is the receipt of bleomycin, the drug that can affect the lungs. The patients who receive the drug, they have lower diffusion capacity. What does that mean? Essentially the ability of the lung to breathe in air and exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we know that this drug affects the lungs short-term and long-term over time. And this data showed for almost six years Patients who receive bleomycin have a lower DLCO and cannot exchange their oxygen and carbon dioxide quite as well. So what are we going to do about this? We know these late effects. We know these toxicities. I loved this data that came out. Jeremy Abramson and others presented data on ANAD. So what did they do? They took that ABVD backbone and said, let's take out the things we don't like. We don't like the bleomycin for early stage patients because it creates lung issues. So let's take it out. We don't love the vemblastine because it sort of suppresses people's immune system and drops their counts and other things. So let's drop it. And we don't like radiation. So let's drop the things we don't like 
add in the new agents, brentoximab and nivolumab, put them both in, and let's see how they do. So I love this, right? An attempt to avoid toxicity. Let's not just layer on these new agents and stack the toxicity. If we're gonna put one in, let's drop something else out so we can cure patients and eliminate toxicity. So ANAD is ABVD without the bleomycin, without the vimblastine, no radiation, and the two novel agents we've been talking about, rentuximab and nivolumab. Here, albeit in patients that was a smaller cohort, 154 patients, the one-year progression-free survival was 100%. About 40% needed growth factor to support their healthy white cells during therapy. There was no febrile neutropenia. About 34% had some treatment-related adverse events. And the medium follow-up is early, but this is really exciting. This is where I'm hoping our field continues to go with new agents. As we layer them in and we've seen how well they work, then we remove other things with toxicity both short-term and long-term. So this was really novel. I love seeing this data. There was additional data on ANAD and other groups as well. And this was, again, the early stage patients, 100% at a year. So then what if we're going to put all these novel therapies in? What are we going to do when patients relapse now that we're using all the things we're using for relapse therapy first? This is an important question. There was another ASH education that came out of this. This is a complex diagram, but really trying to show what is the optimal management now when a patient relapses, if they've already seen these novel agents, such as brentuximab and a checkpoint inhibitor. So this is one of the topics you came here to hear today. I would encourage you to go read this, which is a nice summary, but I'll show you a few highlights. So in the relapse space, we heard some of the increased follow-up on a trial E4412. This trial was trying to look at adding ipilimumab to nivolumab and brentuximab for relapse patients. So adding in a new agent. Now we haven't talked about ipilimumab before. And essentially it attempts to kill hodgkin reed sternberg cells a different way, but very similar to a PD-1 blockade. So you have an antigen presenting cell, essentially a cancer cell for the sake of discussion, who interacts with a T cell. But if the CTLA4 binds to the antigen presenting cell, it turns a T cell off. So if you can block CTLA4 like you did PD-1, then when the cancer cell is exposed to the T cell, the T cell stays on and can kill what we are hoping to be their cancer. So a CTLA4 inhibitor here on the right blocks the signal, the off signal, and stops it so that when the antigen presenting cell interacts with the T cell, the T cell can do its work and do its killing. So this was an attempt to add on a CTLA4 checkpoint blockade for relapse patients. This is incredibly important. So this work with that we saw at ASH showed when you use nivolumab and brentuximab compared to all three agents, there was no difference. These negative outcomes are equally as important as the wins because we don't just wanna keep layering on these new agents. We need to show, do they have an additional benefit above and beyond the others? This was only 126 patients. The average age was 34, but this is chart is showing complete response to their relapse therapy. And you can see that the addition of the triplet compared to just the two nivolumab and brentuximab was not helpful. The triplet, had increased grade three rash in side effects. So this showed that we should not add ipilimumab on top of brentuximab and nevo as a standard of care. Additionally, and for time, I won't go into every single one of them, exciting data and new drugs are still coming. These are three really interesting presentations also at ASH. And one of the questions in the chat had asked us already today, as we use PD-1 blockade, what are going to be the differences in outcomes, not just in short term, did their cancer respond? How does the outcome change after a autologous stem cell transplant for our relapse patients? And how do we use that? And we saw that PD-1 blockade before an autologous transplant improved outcomes in relapse and refractory patients. The very appropriate question in the chat was, so then should we still be doing this follow-up after transplant with brentuximab maintenance? Is that still a thing? That depends on many individual factors. This data is a little too early to know. 
But if brentuximab maintenance was recommended based off risk factors that we knew to use it in and tolerated by the patient, it probably still has a role to try to get a durable remission. There were two other presentations that showed new novel agents that I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, exciting. It's not just these agents we have. There are still new ones on the horizon as we start to take our new ones and move them up front. And we are still seeing efficacy of those agents in relapse patients. So Dr. Leonard touched on this. For cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA, is it useful in Hodgkin lymphoma? We saw another update. There are many, but I wanted to show this one because we've learned several pieces. Several ASH meetings ago, we had seen the importance of circulating to more cell-free DNA and Hodgkin lymphoma. And this year we saw some more specifics of how exactly are we gonna be able to use this data, looking at genomic, transcript transcriptional, and immunological validation of distinct molecular subtypes through this non-invasive method. So what we saw and what this group presented is starting to be really interesting. I think to me, this is where the field is gonna go hopefully before the end of my career. These non-invasive methods started to detect two different molecular subtypes, H1 in red and H2 in blue. And what this is meaning is that if you look at what are the changes seen in these samples, you can see them cluster into two different pieces. About two thirds of them cluster into H1, about a third into H2. The cluster in H1 has high somatic mutational burden, different types of mutations are seen. The cluster in H2 has more recurrent somatic copy number mutations. TP53 and KMT2D are often seen. And in the H2 cluster, we see increased EBV positive cases and increase of younger and older age patients. So where this is really interesting is we've already seen the benefits of sort of this liquid biopsy approach. But now we're starting to see with the data we're getting back, we may be able to actually put these into distinct molecular subtypes that may then matter more than the subtype we originally were looking for under the microscope. So under the microscope, we see different types of pathology, but when we look at the signature, we're seeing different molecular subtypes. And this may be something that we actually utilize as we move forward into the future. So for Hodgkin lymphoma for cell-free DNA, we know that it can easily be detected. Not all cancers are amenable to this, but it can easily be detected, detected from blood samples. And now, and again to Dr. Leonard's comment, do not pay for this out of pocket yet. This is just the research that's super exciting that's gonna come online. As these come mainstream, meaning you can send the test, it's no longer just in a research lab, you can send it to a clinical lab and we're using this. If the field goes there, we will all share that with you. Right now, I'm just sharing exciting research. So we know that you can detect the DNA from the blood. And really interestingly, that the changes in cell-free DNA may predict response to treatment better than our own imaging. And so will it go there? Maybe instead of one of the questions was all these PET scans, hopefully instead of PET scans, you can just send a tube of blood because the cell-free DNA is so easy to be detected that imaging comes with a host of challenges, false positives. It's hard to know. It's hard to know if that little thing is actually from the recent infection they had, or certainly just inflammation of the immune system because it's viral season. However, cell-free DNA tells you whether or not there's lymphoma there. So exciting, we can see it. We now may be able to protect response to treatment even better than imaging. And now with the data we saw from ASH this year, we may be able to determine genetic subtypes that are more meaningful than pathology subtypes under a microscope. And that may change the field as we move forward. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you. It was fun to share with you some updates that we were really excited to hear at ASH meeting this year. And um, we're happy to take more questions at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Forlaghi. Uh, for your excellent presentation. And I am now honored to introduce Dr. Neha Mehta Shah. Dr. Mehta Shah is a hematologist and oncologist at the Alvin J. Seitman Cancer Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, she is also an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Oncology at Washington University. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta Shah, for speaking on our program today, and I will now turn the talk over to you.
think you might be muted. And is my video on G Hope? Oh, there we um, go. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I want to make sure that I leave some room for um, questions and answers in the end. So I'm going to go through some key updates in T-cell lymphomas um, from ASH 2023. And, and this was an exciting year for us as T-cell lymphoma researchers. I'll get to show you uh, what we've learned in the past year. Disclosures. So as, you, as Dr. Leonard had kindly pointed out, there are many, many types of lymphomas, over 100, but only about 10% um, of these are T-cell lymphomas. Um, the most T-cell lymphomas are in the family of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And until recently, most of the research in T-cell lymphomas was really derived from our knowledge of B-cell lymphomas, although these are biologically distinct. So given that T-cell lymphomas are only 10% of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, all of these lymphomas are firmly rare diseases. And what makes it even more complicated is that there are many types of T-cell lymphomas. Roughly half of T-cell lymphomas are peripheral or systemic or in the body T-cell lymphomas. And about half of these are cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, diseases that arise in the skin and that can go into the lymph nodes or the bloodstream, but start off in the skin and often present as a rash. And these groups of diseases are treated uh, differently and with different agents of therapy. And we'll talk about some updates from both categories um, during this um, brief overview. So starting with the peripheral or systemic or in the body T-cell lymphomas, as I mentioned, this makes up about 7% of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. The word peripheral T-cell lymphoma really reflects 19 different diseases um, that all probably have a different biology and different underpinning. And as I mentioned, until recently, all of the studies had just been borrowing therapies from B-cell lymphomas. And in the last decade or two, there's been much more effort directed specifically to T-cell lymphomas, leading to some adva advancements in the field. The most common subtypes, just to orient you, um, as there's lots of terminology, are peripheral T-cell lymphoma not otherwise specified. That makes about a third of the cases. A group of diseases called T follicular helper or TFH phenotype lymphomas, they make up about 16% of these diseases, and they are actually subcategorized into three different uh, categories, something called angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, PTCL, not otherwise specified of T follicular helper phenotype and follicular T cell lymphoma. And I bring that to your attention because um, sometimes on the research presentations, I'll refer to one or two or three of these diseases separately. These are distinct from a group of diseases called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which are then also subdivided based on the presence or the absence of the ALK protein. And we've learned again that different histologies or different diseases actually have unique biology and that informs us that one treatment may not fit all. In general, for patients who have peripheral T-cell lymphomas, I just got asked about a little bit in the chat um, already, these are treated for the purpose of cure for patients who can tolerate combination chemotherapy. And so for the most common types, we give a chemo regimen like CHOP, just like in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, we give that for six times. We usually will get some sort of pictures or PET scan in between to make sure patients are responding. And if they are, we sometimes consider doing an autologous stem cell transplant, which is essentially giving more chemotherapy to wipe away any residual disease that we don't see on the PET. And then give your own stem cells back to help repopulate or replenish the bone marrow and help patients recover. So that's like getting an extra high dose chemotherapy at the end of your six cycles of chemotherapy to try to increase the, the chance that the cancer doesn't come back. And for the initial chemotherapy, uh, we, can, we can give CHOP, which is a combination of uh, three chemo medicines and prednisone. We can give CHOEP, which is CHOP with adding another chemo medicine to this called etoposide. And in patients who have CD30 positive expressing lymphomas, and in particular anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which always expresses CD30, we give brintuximab vidotin, an antibody tag to chemotherapy in, as part of patient's initial treatment. This was on the uh, basis of a large randomized study called Echelon 2, uh, where patients got either CHOP or they got brintuximab with a CHOP like treatment, so replacing the vincristine or oncovin with brintuximab. 
And when they looked at patients who got brintuximab-based therapy, those patients did better. In fact, they lived longer. But this difference was most pronounced in anaplastic large cell lymphoma and less pronounced in the other subtypes. So in patients who have anaplastic large cell lymphoma, both expressing and not expressing the ALK protein, giving brintuximab-based therapy is the standard of care for patients' initial therapy. So the um, one of the updates to ASH was an update to that study. So what they looked at was to say, well, can you use the PET in between while patients are getting treatment to predict outcomes? We had already known that in patients getting CHOP-based therapy, getting a PET in between after four cycles did predict for how patients were going to do long-term. In Echelon 2, when we looked at whether a PET in between is helpful, it still does look like it predicts for better outcomes patients who have a better PET in between or at their interim after four cycles did better than the patients who did not have a favorable PET at that interim time point. Um, so these strategies can be used um, to get an interim PET or a PET scan in between your therapy to start to plan for um, whether you're likely to respond and whether to consider doing things like more chemotherapy in the form of an autologous transplant or start to mentally prepare for other treatment strategies. There are ongoing efforts to improve on this. So there is an effort by, by Alex Herrera at City of Hope in combination with multiple other medical centers to add brintuximab um, vedotin to uh, the CHOP with the topicide regimen. So adding the other etoposide regimen to the brintuximab CHP regimen. And there's a U.S. intergroup study looking at using standard chemotherapy, either CHOP or CHOP with a topicide based on your age, with either a medicine called duvalisib or a medicine called azacitidine. Um, and so those are available uh, nationally and worth um, thinking about if you're newly diagnosed and haven't started treatment yet. Just to highlight the U.S. intergroup study, which I'm uh, fortunate to be highly involved in, patients receive either CHOP or CHOEP as their initial therapy. And then um, they, one of three patients will receive duvalisib and oral therapy that we'll go over in a little bit with their chopper choep, or they get another oral form of azacitidine, a medicine that can modulate the way genes are expressed by the cancer cells um, to chopper choep as well. Um, so look out for that. So now um, going to relapsed and refractory T-cell lymphomas, um, where there were some major updates um, to trials that had been ongoing. We know that patients who have relapsed or refractory T-cell lymphomas historically have had not so great outcomes. But we also know that those patients who can achieve a remission and can get to a donor bone marrow transplant or an allogeneic transplant where your immune system is replaced by someone else's immune system, can be cured um, long-term. And so getting people into remission and getting them into remission swiftly is important. There are many, many options for treatment um, for patients who have relapsed or refractory T-cell lymphoma, T-cell lymphomas that aren't cured with your initial treatment. Some of these are in the form of combination chemotherapies. Some of these are in the form of single agent medicines that either modulate the way the genes are expressed by cancer cells or other single agent chemotherapies, as well as antibody tag to chemotherapy like brintuximab. But each of these only works in a, in a select, in a, a fraction of patients, and each of these only works for so long, meaning we need better treatments and need better treatments that work longer that patients can take for longer. So there are new kids on the block in T cell lymphomas, and, and we're gonna highlight the updates to studies using EZH2 inhibitors, JAK STAT inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors. So EZH2 is a protein that changes the way genes are expressed by cancer cells. Um, cancer, the DNA in all cells is bound by these little proteins called histones and they wrap around, the DNA wraps around these histones into a tightly bound structure. When um, genes are being expressed, the the DNA has to be let a little bit loose from the histones to allow for the DNA to then result in um, proteins being made and, and for the DNA to be read properly. What the EZH2 inhibitors do is they modulate the way the genes are expressed by affecting how the histones um, tie to and get loosened from um, the DNA itself. 
We know that EZH2 inhibitors have already been approved for other lymphomas. In fact, there's a, a drug approved for follicular lymphoma for a number of years now. And only more recently have they been studied in T-cell lymphomas. And we were excited because some studies in Japan had already shown um, that other EZH2 inhibitors were uh, very active in a, in a type of an aggressive T-cell lymphoma called acute uh, T-cell lymphoma leukemia. So there are two EZH2 inhibitors that were presented at our annual meeting um, just past December. One of these was the Valentine study for valimetastat. Valimetastat is an oral EZH2 inhibitor. This was an international trial of 133 patients, um, all of whom had at least one prior treatment for their um, peripheral T-cell lymphoma. And um, in this group of patients, the average age was about 70, which is about the average age of a T-cell lymphoma patient. And most patients had had at least two prior treatments. Everybody got the same dose of the drug and everybody just took the pill every day. When they looked at how well it worked, the drug worked um, in over almost over 50% of patients when using more modern, uh, re modern techniques for evaluating response like PET-CTs. Um, showing that this was quite promising compared to some of the available agents, which only work for about a fourth of people. Um, some of these patients then were able to use the valimetastat to move on to doing a donor bone marrow transplant as well. Additionally, for the patients for whom valimetastat was working, it worked for a, a pretty long time. On the average, it worked for almost a year. Um, which means that this was uh, better than some of the other um, agents that we have previously seen, although not compared directly to each other. We know that the patients who had gotten valimetastat-based treatment were living longer than we usually would expect patients to live with T-cell lymphoma as well, um, making this an exciting agent and one that we think was well-tolerated. And the responses were seen across patients who have different forms of PTs peripheral T-cell lymphoma, meaning it worked in patients who had angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, it worked for people who have peripheral T-cell lymphoma NOS, and it worked for anaplastic large cell lymphomas, as well as in other more rare um, subgroups. Additionally, as I mentioned, the drug was well tolerated, which means that most patients were able to stay on the drug and did not have to come off the medicine because of side effects. Um, the most common side effects were um, low platelet counts, that was temporary and then often recovered on their own. So in general, valimetastat, um, based on this presentation by Dr. Horowitz, um, showed that it was well tolerated and had a promising um, rate of efficacy or working for patients. And it compares favorably to currently available agents. And it's not currently available for patients as standard of care and there are future plans for a, a confirmatory study um, hoping to, um, hoping to uh, make this available for patients long in the future. So more to come about valimetastat. Additionally, um, there was a different study that used a different EZH2 inhibitor in a smaller group of patients, only 34, also showing similar response rates in, um, in peripheral T-cell lymphomas. Um, so there are multiple EZH2 inhibitor studies available throughout the country. And for patients who have uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas in need of other therapy, these types of studies are worth considering. The other class of medicines that was importantly highlighted in, uh, at ASH of 2023 was the JAK-STAT inhibitors. Now JAK and STAT are uh, molecules that are involved in, um, in how cancer cells move from one cancer cell to two cancer cells. And there have been multiple standardly available JAK inhibitors, not only in cancer care, but across um, all sorts of diseases, including even dermatology. Some of these agents have been available for a while. Golidocitinib was the new JAK inhibitor, uh, again, as a, which is a pill um, that was studied in, a, in 112 patients across uh, an international study. And that drug, when given to patients who have relapsed refractory T-cell lymphoma, looked like it worked in almost 44% of people. It had promising activity, again, across different T-cell lymphoma histologies. And at the six-month mark, um, the average person remained on therapy. This um, study, is the schema is highlighted here. Patients took golidocitinib as a pill every day as long, for as long as it was working and as long as they tolerated it. 
Um, and in this study of the, that followed up on the initial thalidocytinib study, there are 119 patients evaluated internationally. The average age of this patient was a little under 60, and most patients had at least two prior lines of therapy. When you looked at that study, it replicated the initial evaluation of thalidocytinib, which looked like it worked in the, about 44% of patients. Um, and again, the drug was well tolerated. So for patients for whom it was working, they were usually able to stay on the drug uh, without needing to come off for other side effects or other complications. And um, for the average person, um, they were able to stay on for more than 20 months. The glitacitinib also shows um, efficacy and uh, promising activity in peripheral T-cell lymphomas. Again, this is a drug that's not yet publicly available. Its toxicity was manageable and it was able to be taken as a pill. Um, and uh, hopefully this will become something available in our armamentarium in the near future. Um, additionally, um, just highlighting outside of ASH, um, that there are another group of medicines that are available for patients currently um, in the family of PI3 kinase inhibitors. And these, again, are um, targeted therapies against a protein that we think is important in cell signaling in T cell lymphomas. And in this study called PRIMO, um, patients took uh, Duvalisib, which is an oral PI3 kinase inhibitor, a drug they take twice a day um, for as long as it was working, where you get a higher dose at the beginning, and then if it's working for you, go down to a lower dose. And that drug also looks like it works in about 50% of patients with um, some idea that it may even work a little better than that in patients who have angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma. So the, um, the other study that I wanted to highlight relates to cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. These are for patients who have T-cell lymphomas in the skin um, that can go into the bloodstream or the lymph nodes, but usually start off in the skin. These are highly heterogeneous and the progno prognosis for patients who have cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is very, very, very variable. And in general, most of our treatments are not meant for cure, um, but they're meant to improve quality of life and also decrease the burden of the disease and make patients' lives more tolerable with this disease. Um, the goal really is to make sure that the treatment, life on treatment is better than life without with the disease, but not on treatment. Therefore, the development of well-tolerated therapies is critical. For patients who have very limited um, skin lymphoma, um, we actually usually use just topical treatments like steroid creams or even topical chemotherapy creams, which can be effective for the areas where they're used. But when patients have more advanced disease, we consider um, treatments throughout the body or if patients have tried topical therapies and they're not working. Again, we try to pick the least toxic medicines first and then try to give them um, sequentially instead of um, giving multiple medicines at the same time that can add to side effects. There are many options for um, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma that are available. Some of these are infusional medicines, some of these are oral medicines. And in interest of time, I'm just gonna briefly mention the background in which um, the current study that, that I'll highlight about lacutamab was centered. Um, the currently available medicines for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma in the more modern world include uh, brentuximab, which we mentioned as an antibody tagged to chemotherapy to give chemotherapy to cancer cells. And that did better than um, the standardly available treatments like metho oral methotrexate, an oral chemotherapy pill, and oral bixeratine, an oral retinoid medicine. However, patients who get brentuximab develop neuropathy, and the neuropathy is often what causes patients to come off of treatment with brentuximab vidotin. Um, on the original study in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, two-thirds of patients develop neuropathy. Um, so on a recent study that was um, performed by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group, they said, well, are there ways to reduce neuropathy and side effects to brentuximab for patients who need to be on brentuximab long-term? And at ASH, um, they presented as a poster that um, you can give lower doses of brentuximab and um, space those infusions apart with hopes of pre preventing long-term debilitating neuropathy and making the treatment more tolerable while keeping the disease under control. So that's a practical, um, a practical pearl um, to that this, this poster presentation and this research presentation provided to patients and providers. Additionally, one of the other medicines that's standardly available for patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is an antibody against CCR4 called mogamulizumab. 
And when molgamulizumab was studied in this randomized study um, across um, and compared to an oral medicine called Gorinostat, did significantly better, um, resulting in the approval of that medicine. And we knew that molgamulizumab works best for the skin and the blood. Um, and for patients who have a high burden of blood disease, this drug is particularly effective. So the study that was presented at ASH by Dr. Porku and colleagues uh, was a study of lacutamab. Lacutamab is an antibody medicine against a protein called CureDL2. And that protein is highly expressed on cutaneous T cell lymphomas, and in particular, those who have a high degree of blood involvement in a disease called Cesare syndrome. So in um, Cesare syndrome, when lacutamab was initially studied, it looked like it worked in, four, in almost 40% uh, of patients. So that led to this international study where patients with Cesare syndrome got lacutamab, and then people who had other forms of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma also received lacutamab. And at ASH, um, they presented the results of the Cesare syndrome cohort. But in Cesare syndrome, uh, amongst the patients who were treated, it looked like it overall worked in all the areas where the disease was in 40% uh, of patients, and the average patient for whom it worked could stay on for more than a year. Um, and the drug was very well tolerated with a minimal risk of fatigue and rash um, and a minimal risk of infection. The other group of drugs um, that were uh, being highlighted recently include medicines that um, allow the other forms of the immune system to gobble up the cancer cells. And this includes the medicine called CD40, medicines that block a protein called CD47. And I'd like to highlight that people are trying to build upon the existing data for mogamulizumab by adding medicines that help to block CD47 at, through a NIH or NCI sponsored study that is currently available as well. So if you're looking for other studies in, in cutaneous T cell lymphoma, these are some of them. And to build on the EZH2 inhibitor study, um, there are currently also studies looking at whether these EZH2 inhibitors or oral medicines that modulate the way genes are expressed by cancer cells um, can also be effective in cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And lastly, I'll briefly mention that there are also studies for CAR T cells and T cell lymphoma. A number of them are listed here. Um, these include um, studies for cutaneous and peripheral T cell lymphoma. And some of these initial results, although very, very early with very few numbers of patients, seem partic particularly promising. So the key takeaways is that there are multiple promising new classes of medicines for, for cutaneous and peripheral T cell lymphomas. And some of these are gonna be, have to be confirmed in, in phase three randomized studies before they, we, reach, we gain approval for these drugs and make them available for the average patient in the United States. So the, key, the other portion that I wanted to highlight is clinical trials are critically important. As you can see, many of these, many of these trials are of agents that we already have an idea may work really well in a particular disease subtype. And until recently in T-cell lymphomas in particular, there were very few um, treatments that were being developed specifically for T-cell lymphomas. And in the current world, there are lots more of them. And some of these agents and, and trials can not only afford you options that are beyond the standardly available options, but sometimes come with uh, oral options for therapy or better tolerated therapy. And it certainly adds to your uh, menu for options for treatment uh, beyond what is standardly available. And even in some of the very early phase one studies, which historically um, patients sometimes are nervous about joining, we know that data um, shows that even with in these very early studies, that the results from these very early studies is more promising than the data that we compiled from them 10 or 15 years ago, because they're often developed in, with the idea of specific diseases in mind and their biology. So please do feel free to talk to your healthcare provider about options for clinical trials and certainly reach out to the Lymphoma Research Foundation. They do an excellent job of um, helping to guide patients across this you know, large breadth of information and how to navigate um, looking for clinical trials as part of their treatment. Um, and your other resource can include looking up the clinical trials in your disease type on clinicaltrials.gov. And with that, I'm going to leave you with some time, hopefully not going too much over, but leaving you some time for questions. Thank you so much, share. Dr. Mehta Shah, um, for your presentation and to really all of our speakers for helping address all of those questions in the Q&A box. Um, I think we're going to get to about one question per speaker uh, just to wrap up our talk here. 
Um, starting with Dr. Leonard, uh, does getting one of the new bispecific antibodies make it harder to get a CAR T cell therapy if necessary later on? Yeah, that's a, a great question. The quick answer is no, it doesn't, meaning that you can get one and then get the other in either order. That being said, we're still figuring out the best way to sequence. Some people might prefer to try one first and to try the other later only if needed. And, you know, it also is important to note that particularly CAR T cells do have some issues with immune function and infections and low blood counts afterwards. That's not a reason to save them for later necessarily, but it does mean that, you know, certain people might have some side effects that might make it more challenging to get other therapies. But that being said, um, there are people who've gotten it in either direction and done, done well and had benefits. So um, all these things at this point are individualized with your doctor to sort out what's best for you, but those are an option for some people. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard. Um, and Dr. Mehta Shah, our next question here is, are any of the new treatments showing promising results for patients with ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma? Um, yeah, so I think, um, I, I apologize, we had to go through some of the presentation quickly for time, but many of the agents that were just highlighted worked actually across a number of different types of T-cell lymphoma, including anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So these include um, the PI3 kinase inhibitors, the EZH2 inhibitors, and the JAK-STAT inhibitors. And there are many, the, these were some of the larger trials that have um, that were performed internationally that were presented at ASH, but there are certainly other studies of using um, bispecific antibodies against CD30, which are um, which would which at least theoretically should have a lot of promise in in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which are also currently available. CAR T cell studies in T cell lymphoma that might be particularly good for anaplastic large cell lymphoma um, that are also available. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Leonard, I'm actually gonna squeeze in one more question for you. Uh, what long-term side effects are being seen in follicular lymphoma patients who have taken rituximab for two-year maintenance therapy? So that's an important question because a lot of people are considering or have considered or received that. I think the biggest issue uh, and ret maintenance rituximab in follicular lymphoma, it's different in other lymphomas, but in follicular lymphoma, um, keeps you in remission longer in many situations, but doesn't necessarily make you live longer. And so there's a trade-off there. The main side effects or issues are, A, you have to go back to the doctor's office to get more infusions over the course of two years, which may or may not be something that people are enthusiastic about. Uh, and the biggest issue is that it suppresses the normal B cells, some of the normal immune cells, and that can predispose to infections and in particular, that seems to be an issue in the era of COVID and in responding to COVID vaccinations and the protection from COVID vaccinations. And so many of us, since you don't necessarily live longer from maintenance for tuximab and follicular lymphoma, are using less of it because we worry about the risk of to the immune system and other of other infectious issues. And for a small percent, but a meaningful percent of people, you can also get kind of nagging infections, respiratory infections, sinus infections that can be an issue. So really something to talk about the trade-offs with your doctor before you decide that. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Furlaghi, I have a question for you next. Um, are there any good references that speak to the performance of CAR-T for the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma? Laughing as I looked at this. So speaking, you know, we gave ASH updates. To me, yet there are no fabulous references for CAR-T for Hodgkin lymphoma, but it's hopefully coming. What we've seen is that while it works for a subset of patients, not usually, usually durable, meaning even though we do see some of their disease go away, it usually does come back. And so we've seen them being used as a bridge. We're not being seen them seen as a cure like we are in some other diseases. Um, there was one presentation at ASH about the resistance. So why does that happen? And so maybe we'll learn more about the immune system and how those cells are coming back and figure out something to give with the CAR therapy that'll make it work better. But right now, the momentum is focused on the drugs we have and CAR is sort of left to a little bit of a last resort at the moment. Um, 
but more coming as it improves all the time and we learn more about this escape. Thank you so much, Dr. Furlagi. Um, and I'm gonna cut us off there since we're reaching, you know, quite over time here, but thank you so much to each of you for joining us on today's webinar. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors again, Kite and Lily again, for making this program possible. Uh, please remember if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to our helpline at 800-500-9976. Um, but with that, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Again, um, we really enjoyed your time and we always appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.